Good morning, everyone, and happy Thursday. We are here for our second Gail Gibbons Read Aloud of the Week. This will also be our last Gail Gibbons Read Aloud that we will do for a while. So on Tuesday, we read a Gail Gibbons story, and that story was about penguins. We talked about some different kinds of penguins, what they eat, what they look like, their enemies. And then you guys also got a chance to write some cool facts that you learned about penguins. Um, additionally, we talked about our objective or our standard for the week, which involves trying to figure out why the author wrote the text. So why did Gail Gibbons write the text? Now, if you guys said that Gail Gibbons wrote that penguins text to inform us, to give us information, you are correct. So today's story, we are also going to try to figure out why Gail Gibbons wrote this text. Today's text is called The Honeymakers. Now, if you look very closely at the illustration, you will see what we will be reading about, who the honeymakers are. As we read and as you listen, I want you to think about why Gail Gibbons wrote this text. Again, to remind you, there are three reasons that an author writes a text. The first one is to persuade their readers. That means to make them believe something. The second reason is to inform the readers. And that just means to give information about something, about a topic. And the third reason is to entertain, to make us laugh. All right, so as I read and as you're listening, I want you to be thinking very carefully about why Gail Gibbons wrote the text, The Honeymakers. All right, I want you to take a look at the cover today, and I want you to tell me what you notice. What do you notice on the cover? Hmm. So as we know, our author and illustrator is the same person, Gail Gibbons, okay? The Honeymakers. What do you notice about the cover and about the title? And as you take some time to think about that, I'm going to actually turn it to the back and I'm going to read a little summary of this for you. So it says the honeymakers, how sweet it is. Thousands of bees visited more than one million flowers to gather the nectar that went into that one pound jar of honey. Here's the buzz on how these remarkable insects work together to create this amazing food. All right, so that just kind of gives you a little hint, a little summary of what our text is going to be about. And if you have already looked on to our writing assignment for today, you will know that we are going to be talking about how bees work together to survive. Okay, so as I read, I want you to be thinking about that. What are some ways that bees work together to survive? Okay, and you'll have to give examples from the story, from the text. So let's go ahead and get started. It is springtime. Two beekeepers have placed a beehive on a hill. So here's our beekeepers. Here's the beehive on the hill. Activity begins around the hive. The honeybees and the beekeepers are... Hmm, so let's look at the illustrations. What do you notice about the beekeepers? Hmm notice about the beekeepers? And what do you notice about the hive? Okay, so again, we have the honey makers. This is our title page. So here's where the hive is. All right, we should look carefully at this illustration here. What do you notice? So we've got the honey bee. Okay, we've got some bees on the flowers. And over here we have what is called a colony. Hmm, honeybees travel to and from the hive. Their earliest ancestors lived about 80 million years ago. The scientific name for honeybee comes from the Latin words apis mellifera, meaning honey bearer. Honeybees are social creatures. They form highly structured groups called colonies. In a colony, as many as 50,000 or more bees live together and work at their own special jobs. So let's look down here. It says a colony is a group of animals that live and work together. So a colony would be like our classroom. We could also refer to our classroom as a colony. Up here we see the wild honeybee hive. 
Many honeybees like to make their homes in dark, enclosed places. Often a colony of wild honeybees builds its hive in a hollow tree. Honeybees cared for by today's beekeepers live in box-shaped wooden hives. So here we see this wooden hive. Inside the beehive, the honeybees are building an amazing structure called a honeycomb. It is made up of countless six-sided cells. Stored in many of these wax cells is the food that bees and people love to eat, honey. Okay, so here we have honeycomb. This is the honey, and these are the cells. So this is all inside this. Got a good diagram here. So here we see worker bee, drone bee, queen bee. Three different kinds of honeybees live inside all beehives. There is one queen, about 100 male drones, and thousands of female worker bees. Like all insects, bees have three body parts. There's the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Honeybees have other parts too. So we obviously know that this is the head, the thorax here, and the abdomen here. So three parts. The queen is the largest of the honeybees and she can live the longest from three to five years. All the other bees in the colony live for about two months, except over winter, when they live a few months longer. It is the queen's job to make sure the hive never runs out of bees. To do this, she leaves the hive to mate with her drones. Then she lays as many as 2,000 eggs a day. Drones are usually smaller than the queen. Their only job is to mate with her. So here we have the drone bee and the queen bee. And back here we have the hive. So there are three kinds of honeybees. What did you learn about the three different kinds? Remember we have the queen bee, the drone bee, and the worker bee. Those are our three different kinds. Most cells in the beehive are used for storing honey, but some are used for the queen to lay her eggs. These are called brood cells. In each brood cell, a bee will develop and grow. The largest brood cells are queen brood cells, also called royal cells. Drone brood cells are smaller. Even smaller are the worker brood cells. The eggs in those cells will become worker bees. Although all worker bees are female, they do not lay eggs. Instead, they do the work of the beehive. Okay, so we see some over here. We've got the worker bee here. We've got the worker brood cell where it's making more worker bees. We've got the queen brood cell or the royal cell. That's where the queen bee will come out of. And then we've got the drone brood cell which holds the drone bees. Most eggs the queen lays are no bigger than the period at the end of this sentence. So most of them are no bigger than that little dot right there. After three days, a larva hatches from each one. For the next three days, worker bees called nurse bees feed the larva bee milk. Then they feed it bee bread. A queen larva is fed royal jelly throughout its growth. So here's the larva. Here's the worker bee that's called a nurse bee. Here's the royal jelly the bee milk, the bee bread, and the queen larva. Each larva grows quickly, then spins a silky cocoon around itself. Inside the cocoon, a pupa develops. A nurse bee seals the cell with wax. So here we've got the cocoon, we've got the nurse bee, Sealing that with wax. And then up here is the pupa. 
Little by little, the pupa changes. It begins to look more like an adult insect. This process is called metamorphosis. Queens develop in about 16 days from the time the eggs are laid. The metamorphosis of drones and workers takes about 21 to 24 days. Finally, after the transformation is complete, an adult bee chews its way out of the brood cell, an adult honeybee. So here we have the metamorphosis, and here we have the adult honeybee that has chewed itself out. This honeybee is a worker bee. From the minute she comes out of her brood cell, she is as busy as a bee. For the next three weeks, she will have a number of different jobs to do inside the hive. First, she is a house bee, cleaning and polishing the cells. About three days later, she becomes a nurse bee. So here she's the house bee, here she's the nurse bee. After 10 days of being a nurse bee, she becomes a wax making bee. She makes flakes of wax in her abdomen and chews them to mold new cells or repair old ones. Wax making bees are also in charge of storing the nectar and pollen that other honeybees bring back to the hive. Other workers care for the queen. They are her court. They cluster around the queen to continually feed and groom her. So we've got the wax making bee, and then down here we've got the court, so the little group. So honeybees have many different jobs, such as the worker bee. What do you think the worker bees do? About a week later, the wax making bee becomes a guard bee and begins its outdoor life. Guard bees protect the hive. They chase away intruders with their stingers. They also alert the other bees by spreading a special scent when there is danger. A guard bee will sometimes die in battle to protect the hive and its honey. So here we have the stinger. Here we've got the enemy. We've got the guard bee guarding the hive. The worker bee is now about three weeks old. She is ready to become a forager bee, her last job, but a very important one. Forager bees are the bees you see zipping from flower to flower. They collect sweet juices called nectar from the flowers for honey making. Here's the forager bee. So these are the one you see travel from flower to flower to get the nectar. At each flower, the forager bee collects nectar with her proboscis. She stores the nectar in a special part of her body called the crop or honey stomach. This stomach is separate from her other stomach. As she goes from flower to flower, she comes in contact with a yellow powder called pollen. Some of the pollen is collected in little baskets formed by the special hairs on her hind legs. So we have crop, or honey stomach, right here. We have the proboscis and the pollen basket. As the forager bee collects nectar, she carries pollen from flower to flower. This is part of a process called pollination. When she has visited many flowers and her crop is full, she beelines back to her hive. So what is happening here? Hmm. What does a bee do once it's filled its stomach? What does the bee do once its stomach has been filled? Here we see a little description of pollination. It says pollination is the movement of pollen from the stamen to the stigma of the same kind of plant. This makes seeds to grow new plants. So we have the stamen and the pollen and the stigma up here. Back inside the hive, the forager bee brings up or regurgitates the nectar. Then she transfers it by tongue to a hive bee. The nectar is passed by tongue among the hive bees until some of its moisture is gone. Then a wax making bee places the nectar in a honey cell. There it continues to dry. So 
here we have the honey cell. So there's lots and lots of steps involved in making honey that some of you may eat. Here we have the nectar, we have the hive bee, the forager bee, and the wax making bee. More and more nectar is added to the honey cell. House bees cluster over the cell and fan their wings to evaporate even more of the moisture in the nectar. As the nectar loses water, it becomes thicker and thicker. Finally, wax making bees cap or seal the cell with wax. Slowly, the nectar ripens into honey. So honey is about 18% water. Hmm. So an interesting little fact there. So 18% of honey is water. So what new information has Gail Givens shared about how honeybees make honey that you might not have already known? What kind of new information has she shared with us? When forager bees return to their hive, they have a special way of telling the other forager bees of important discoveries, like a new location of flowers full of nectar and pollen. They do the dances of the bees. So they've got the circle dance, the wagtail dance. So the circle dance says the forager honeybee circles in one direction, turns around and circles back the other way. This dance tells the other forager bees to look for new flowers anywhere within 300 feet of their hive. So that's the circle dance. Then we've got the wag tail dance. So here we have the wag tail dance. This dance tells the other forager honeybees that the flowers are farther than 300 feet away. The direction she dances while wagging her tail tells where the flowers are in relation to the sun. The number of wags per 15 seconds tells how far away the flowers are. Pretty interesting. A forager honeybee can visit up to 10,000 flowers a day. All the nectar she collects in her entire life can make only about one teaspoon of honey. Super, super tiny. To make one pound of honey, it takes nectar from over one million flowers. Also, different kinds of honey come from different kinds of flowers. Honeybees have always been valued for the honey they make. For thousands of years, people have stolen honey from wild beehives. People became beekeepers when they began to make their own hives. Some used hollow logs, others used clay pots. Later, in about 1500, European beekeepers started using upside-down basket hives called skeps. Then, in about 1850, the hanging movable frame beehive was invented. So here we have the wild hive. We have the hollow log hive. We've got the clay pot hive, the skep, and the hanging movable frame beehive. So that's all the different phases that the beehive has gone through, starting here and then where we're at today. On top of the hill is a modern beehive. The beehive is stacked in sections. In each section hang about 10 wooden frames where the bees build their honeycombs. To help the bees build their honeycombs faster, the beekeeper places wax foundations in the frames. So the honey super is the section that the beekeepers will harvest. Then we have the food chamber and that's where the bees store the honey they need for their food. Then we have the brood chamber, which is where the queen lays her eggs. Then we have the entrance and the exit for the bees. Down here we see a little remark about a foundation. A foundation is a sheet of wax impressed on both sides with a pattern of honey bee cells. Now we've got the beekeepers here. It's time for the beekeepers to harvest the honey. The honey bees have had several months to build and fill the honeycombs. The colder the winter, the more food they will need. The beekeepers move slowly around the hive. 
They wear special clothes and use special equipment to protect themselves from getting stung. So they've got a helmet with a veil. They've got a metal hive tool is used for prying apart the frames that are stuck together. It says a smoker calms the bees so they don't sting them. Then they also wear gloves and they have white coveralls with elastic or ties at the wrist and ankles. White makes bees feel calm. <coughs> and they also have boots that they wear. Back at home in a shed, the beekeepers use a hot knife to cut the wax caps off the honeycomb. Then the honeycomb frame is placed inside an extractor. It spins around at a high speed to remove the honey without breaking the honeycomb. The honey goes into a collecting tank. So we've got the extractor, the hot knife, and the collecting tank. Next, the honey is filtered through a screen and a cloth to remove small pieces of wax. Then the honey is packed in airtight jars. Sometimes beekeepers melt down old and damaged honeycombs to make beeswax candles and other things. The rest of the empty honeycomb frames are returned to the hive for the honeybees to fill again. And then the process continues. For some beekeepers, honey making is a hobby. They use the honey themselves or give it away as gifts. Commercial beekeepers provide stores and shops with gleaming jars of their product to sell. Delicious, sweet honey from the honey makers. We've got honey here, honey here. They're putting it on a piece of toast. And then at the back of our book, it just kind of gives little excerpts of what happens each month for the beekeeper. So it says a beekeeper's yearbook. So this is just kind of little journal entries each month when they visit the beehive. Just things that they do. Then there's some extra facts about the bees. And that is the end of our text today. So my number one question here is, why did Gail Gibbons write this text? Hmm. Did she write to try to make us believe something or to persuade us? Did she write it to inform us or give information about something? Or did she write it to entertain us and make us laugh? I want you to think about that as you complete your writing assignment. Go ahead and get out your writing assignment for today. You will see that it has day four at the top. Sorry, it's a little crooked. So our question today says, how do bees work together in groups to survive? Give two examples from the text. All right, and then you can use this box up here to draw a picture if you would like. So you are telling me how bees work together in groups to survive, and you have to give me at least two specific examples that you heard in the text to support your response of how bees work together. Okay, so you should have a good five sentences at least. Make sure you have at least five to seven words in each sentence. Use a capital letter at the beginning. Use your very best neat handwriting, your finger spaces, and all sentences should have punctuation at the end. If you want to challenge yourself and see how far down you can write, that's great. Go ahead and challenge yourself. If you want to give more than two examples from the text of how bees work together, even better. Okay, good luck. If you need to go back and listen to the story, you can work hard and I will see you guys next week for another read aloud. Have a great weekend and I'll see you guys next week.